very much. I'm pretty sure I could just about do this without this microphone. Right? <laughs> but anyway, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Yes, I, uh, I am an avid fisherman and I've got a YouTube channel that's quite popular and I've set out right from the start my motto has been to promote the fun aspect of fishing. We see so much people talking about the biggest catches and sometimes they don't even smile. We'll see them, we've all seen them, big fish in their hand and they just look like someone's just stabbed their cat. You know, so I've always set out to focus on the fun because I do have a lot of fun. And as Hillary spoke about this morning, the adventure. I just uh, absolutely love the adventure, the adventurous part. I often go exploring new waterways in search of adventure. And if Hillary uh, understood how I was training snakes, well, the danger part would mean that every year trip is an adventure because there's certainly an element of risk. But anyway, talking a while with trout. Right, uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about has already been covered. That's uh, just one of the quirks of coming on later in the session. Why do we use the term wild when talking about trout? Well, as you have been sort of told earlier, wild comes from pretty much trout that have recruited naturally in the wild. They're not stocked fish. You've already uh, had that explained earlier. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about the best trout bait, the uh, best trout lures, the best time of day, and a rod and line and reel setup that you should be using. Now, a lot of the stuff we've seen today has come from a scientific approach, a, uh, a lot of research. Mine's purely from an observation sort of perspective, although, coincidentally, a lot of what I'm going to say has already been sent by scientists anyway, so my observations pretty much align with some of the research that's been done. Now, best trout bait for worms. Now, just under the surface there where it says best trout bait, you'll see match the hatch. Matching the hatch is a term that fly fishermen use quite a lot because I see a hatch of insects. You know, Hillary mentioned mayflies this morning. There can be snowflake caddis. There's so many things that can be hatching. And fly fishermen like to match that hatch with a fly that's the same as what the fish are likely to be feeding on. Now, matching the hatch isn't just, isn't just stuck with fly fishing. It's something that we should all be doing with all of our fishing. For example, worms. Worms are one of the best baits you can get for trout, provided the ground is wet. In August and September, when it's been raining and there's lots of water flowing out of the gullies, the water's dirty and the tide, worms are dynamite bait. Throw a worm into a stream in the middle of April, the trout won't even sniff it. They might in areas south of the Great Dividing Range where the rainfall's a bit higher, but up here in northeast Victoria, when it hasn't rained for weeks, you're wasting your time with worms. And yet our native fish, the blackfish, will still take worms. Redfin, yellow belly, carp, cod, they'll all still take worms regardless of how much rain you've had. But trout, we really need to match the hatch. If there's been a lot of rain and the stream's high, you can't go past worms. In April, March and April, when we're coming towards the end of summer and things are cooling, we usually notice a lot of crickets, particularly around street lights. That's where you're getting, you go out after dark, you go under a street light, you collect trick, your crickets to go fishing. But because there's a lot of crickets in the environment, you'll catch trout on crickets. I've made one of my YouTube videos called Trout Fishing with Crickets and I was climbing all over pretty I only had half a dozen crickets and had to go back to Lewis pretty soon, pretty quickly. But if you were to use crickets in August and September, after we've had a lot of rain and the streams are high and it's cold, the trout probably won't have any a look in because they're just not there. You've got to match the hats, hatch the hatch and use what's there. This time of year, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are a great bait. This time of year the grass is drying off, we get hatches of grasshoppers. When we're walking the banks of the river, there'll be grasshoppers uh, jumping out everywhere near our feet. This is the right time of year to use grasshoppers if you're bait fishing. And mullows. Mullows are the nymph stage of a dragonfly. The mullow lives under the surface, then when the conditions are right, you'll climb a bit of grass and, and emerge to the surface. His wings will hatch out and he'll fly away. So in these warm spring days when we see a lot of mullows around, that means the mullows are coming out from wherever they're hiding and making their way to the surface. So if there's, if there's, if there's um, dragonflies in the air, there's a fair chance the trout are going to be feeding on mullows. Now let's talk about lures. There's four main types of lures, main types. There's other different sorts you can use, but mostly we use spinners, or labelled spinners, sometimes they call them inline spinners. Minnows, like little rapalas and wild boats that I use. Soft plastics and flies. Now, there's different levels of, of fishing ability. New people to fishing will probably prefer spinners. You cast them out, you reel them in, the fish likes it, you'll bite them, you'll catch a fish. Minnows can be slightly harder to use because they often dive, and they can dive down and pick up slime. So you've got to hold your rod tip up a little bit to keep the minnow up a little bit. But minnows are a little bit more natural than bladed spinners. Because trout are quite smart, 
If they think that something's not right, quite often they'll follow the lure in, but they won't take it. So they quite often will see that bladed spinners will trout, will follow and not strike it. Sometimes switching to a minnow is a little bit more natural, it looks like a little, little fish in the system. That can be uh, that can be a big advantage and you might start catching fish. Soft plastics, once again, is a next step harder to use because you can cast them straight out and reel them straight in, but they will work best for you if you're in part a little bit of action into your rod tip and get your soft plastic swimming around and looking like it's alive. Because that takes a level of making it natural to a whole new level. So more natural, you're more likely to tempt the bigger fish, but it takes a, a, a different level of skill to use it. And then we've got flies, fly fishing. Fly fishing, a lot of people here obviously go fly fishing. Fly fishing is the best way to fool the biggest, smartest and most cunning trout. But it also brings a degree of difficulty all upon itself. And you need a great deal of patience if you don't like catching trees. Because I'm good at that. So basically they're the main types of Spinners are the easiest. They're very effective, but they can be the hardest at tempting the bigger fish. Then we have the minnows, that are still quite easy to use, but a little bit harder and a bit more natural. Then the soft plastics are a little bit harder again, but more natural, and then down to the fly. So I hope that sort of gives you an understanding of lures. If you're fishing and you're getting lots of follows with your, your lure, whether it's a minnow or a bladed spinner, try going to a soft plastic or something a bit more natural, because for whatever reason, that trout is hesitant to hit your lure. And by going something a little bit more natural, you might be able to just tempt him into a strike. Now, best time of the day. This is a bit of a, this is something that was touched on upon earlier when I think it was JD actually. This varies so much. This is something that I get asked quite a lot when people comment on my videos. What's the best time of day to catch trout? There's so many variables. For example, in the springtime, when the weather's not really warm but it's starting to warm up, the middle of the day might be okay when the temperature's around that 20, 22 degree mark. There's a few insects starting to hatch and then that might just stimulate a little bit of trout feeding activity. In the middle of January, on a 43 degree day, well, the insects, if they hatch in the middle of the day, they'll probably die straight away. So the evening will always might be the best or early in the morning. It all depends what bait you're using, whether you're matching a hatch if you're fly fishing. But a rule of thumb, just a, a really rough guideline, in the springtime and in the autumn when it's cool, don't be scared to fish the middle of the day. I remember fly fishing in April once, didn't do much good in the morning, and then between around about 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we caught 29 trout. You do that in January, you might not catch any trout that time of day because as was spoken about earlier, during the heat of the day, quite often they'll just sit down the bottom of the deep holes in the shade and sulk and you won't catch them until the evening or the morning. Now, speaking of the real hot summer days, early morning is best. The water is warm and of an evening, it's been in the sun all day and it's warmed up, even though the night's uh, still quite warm in the summer. And it might just be enough just to take the edge off it early in the morning and you might find a fish feeding. So, Time of day varies from time to time of year and with the environment. But on the mild days, the middle of the day is really good, and on hot days, try the early, early morning and late evening. A rod, a rod, reel, and line setup for trout fishing. People often ask me as well, you know, what's a good starting point? And, and that's hard for me because I only use what I've got. I don't know hundreds of rods and reels that are on the uh, that are on display in the tackle stores. Basically. If you are fishing predominantly larger rivers, larger waterways, you might want a longer rod, something around a six foot six to seven foot, even seven foot six. A longer rod will give you greater casting distance. If you are mainly fishing small streams, a longer rod is going to give you a world of difficulty because you're going to be touching trees and you're going to find it hard to click underarm. So you're going to want a shorter rod. So I'm lucky I've got several different rods of several different sizes. But if you just wanted to buy a trout rod and reel, that's a good all rounder. I would look at something around about the six foot length. A graphite based body is much stiffer. They, uh, they are much better for casting, but they also break easier, so they're not great for kids or clumsy people. Whereas a soft tip rod will be a lot stronger, but your casting accuracy can be affected. So yeah, I would look at something around a six foot length, graphite based. Now, with a reel, with a spinning reel to put on that for, uh, for chasing a trout. I would just go for something 1,000 to 2,000 size. You don't want a reel that's too big and too heavy that doesn't balance well with the rod that you're using. So use something that's around about the 2,000 size or 1,000 size. But something that I always look to, and you can see it in this reel here, just under this rule, 6.2 to 1 gear ratio. That means it's a fast reel. You can get really slow reels down at 4.1 or 4 to 1 gear ratio. Quite common to find reels with a 5 to 1 gear ratio. My personal preference is a 6 to 1 gear ratio, a fast reel. 
I don't always reel it fast, but when you're in a bigger river, say you're in the Halper River, which we've spoken about a lot today, and the current's strong at springtime and you want to use a bladed spinner, you really need to get that reel cranking because you need the, the spinner to be working faster than the current, otherwise it's not going to spin. I always think that when you're trout fishing, it's easier to turn a fast reel slow than it is to turn a slow reel fast, if that makes sense. So uh, definitely you, know, you look, look for something around the 6 to 1 gear ratio. I've got a bonus tip, it's all about casting. What that means is, you can have a $500 rod and reel, but it's no good gear if you can't cast it. You can use a $10 rod and reel from Kmart with, with Barney, the dinosaur on the side of it, and if you can cast that straight, you'll catch more than what you would using a $500 reel. The biggest asset you will have to fishing for trout is casting. In the little streams, I often fish little streams. If I'm casting and I drop a metre short, I'm likely to spook the fish if I'm using a lure. If I'm casting and I go a metre too far, I'm likely to catch a blackberry or a tree or something. It's all about the casting. If I can get it in the right spot, you'll catch more fish. And that is for any lure fishing. That's for uh, whether you're trout fishing, whether you're cod fishing, yellow belly fishing. Casting accuracy is the number one most important aspect to any sort of lure fishing. Something I just quickly want to touch on as well before I finish. The scientists have spoken a few times here today about this, this trout moving upstream and uh, not being down, down the lower reaches of the streams as often. That is 100% accurate. I, uh, I have seen it in my years. I've been fishing for trout for over 30 years. I'm 44 now, so probably 35 years I've been fishing for trout. There are streams that I used to catch trout in all year round. And a really good example, if any of you here know it, is the middle, is the middle creek of my ray. It runs into a 15 mile creek. We used to catch trout there all year round. Now, I was up there last week, and it's about that wide, and it's going to be lucky to fly by Christmas. The last four or five summers in a row, it's stopped. So that's probably one of the reasons the fish swim upstream. When I talk to people about this, I, I refer to the term climate change. Some people call it global warming. Or whatever, but for whatever reason, the climate is changing, and some of the streams on the 15 mile creek, the middle creek, and this that some of you people will be familiar with. They just dry up now, they just don't flow like they used to. We seem to still get average rainfall a lot of years. It's only 2016 we had a big flood, and in 2018 the creeks dry again. That's just, I'm not, I can't figure exactly what it is, whether we get the rain in smaller, like bigger amounts over shorter periods of time rather than seeping rains perhaps. When I talk to people, the first thing they do is they blame the farmers. But it's not always the farmers. These streams are drying up upstream of the farms, up in the headwaters, up in the, uh, in the hills, before any water can be pumped out of them. So unfortunately the climate is changing. And another quick thing I want to talk about is trout movement. Trout, as we've said, as has been spoken about today, trout will often go upstream looking for cooler water. What I find personally, in the springtime when the season first opens, I have a lot of luck in the rural, the rural streams that flow through the farmland, the lower, the lower altitude streams. And then, as the, water, as the weather starts to warm up, about now, October, November, they start to become pretty slow fishing because the fish are moving upstream into the headwaters. And by the middle of summer, I pretty much only fish right up in the headwaters because those lower altitude streams are too warm and the trout have moved out. But because they're not there in the summer, it doesn't mean they're not there ever. If you go back there next year when the season opens, the trout will be back down there feeding again because there's a lot of food source down there that hasn't been picked up during the summer and then it'll, they'll move their way up. So in the summer they go up in search of colder water and in the, uh, in the spring when the season first opens they'll come back downstream looking for, for uh, places to feed and just distribute a little bit and until the weather warms up and they move back upstream again. So that's, as I said, they're just all personal observations and they vary from stream to stream but that's uh, how a lot of the streams that I fish work. And anyhow, this one here this is a photo of, uh, of JD holding a big trout, and I photoshopped my head onto it. Is that how it works, JD? <laughs> That's my biggest ever trout. That's a wild trout that came out of the Kiva River on Christmas Day. It was 2011, it was 10 o'clock at night. Fishing off a bridge with a little strike tight and soft plastic. Anyway, thank you all very much. Okay.